Happy Sunday, everybody. Welcome back to the Conservation Conversation. This is episode 11, and I'm very excited. We're going to talk about fish fraud, which is something that is a huge problem internationally, and it has a lot of ramifications that go through to it, and that includes illegal fishing, uh, it includes slavery, and it includes a few other very bizarre surprises. So anyway, uh, welcome to episode 11. I can't wait to get into it and start talking about this today. Uh, so here we go. Um, it's our world. Hey, let's talk about it. Episode 11. All right, here we are. Welcome back. Let's see. Let's get everything adjusted there. Hello, Andrea. That's fantastic. Andrea is in from Romania. I'm Michelle. Hey, Michelle from, from Florida. Nice to see you on here today. It's great to have everybody here. I'm very excited. This is a, a very exciting episode for me, and it's also a very personal episode for me. We're going to show some of the videos of some of the experiences that I've had around the world dealing with fighting against illegal fishing. Hey, Tanya. Good to see you. Hi, Carrie. Another amazing water activist. Um, it's, you know, it's so nice, this, this family that we've developed here at the Conservation Conversation, because it's exactly what we need. And, and here we have it, an amazing international conversation starting up. Um, <clears throat> so what I wanted to talk today about is the concept of reframing our point of reference. And it comes from a very simple idea. So what I wanted to do was actually start today before we get into fishing, to start with a quote from Malatesta, who says basically that if a man is, now this is an Italian translation, so it's not exact, but if a man is raised from birth with shackles around his legs, he will think the shackles gave him the ability to walk and will fight to the death anyone that tries to remove them. So this idea is that concepts think define us. Now, one of these concepts that has we've learned over time has really changed is the idea that the ocean is limitless. It's boundless and it's our resource. Now, when we're going to talk about fishing today, I want to make it very clear. Uh, I personally don't eat fish. Um, hey, Camilla, Camilla from the UK. Uh, I don't eat fish. Um, I, I don't go fishing, but I'm not talking here about local fishermen or people that go down to the lake or even commercial fishermen in the sense of commercial fishing boats. What I'm talking about here is the fishing industry. It's a worldwide commerce. Um, and it's sad because it's actually treated as a commodity when in fact it's our resource. Hey, I'm glad to see Bruce joining us and Vicky. It's, oh, I'm glad you guys are here today. This is gonna be a really amazing episode. And I don't know if anybody out there eats fish, but what we're gonna talk about today is fish fraud. Now, it's very, very difficult. And the reason that I wanted to, to show you all this is um, it's such a huge industry, but 120 billion fish are killed in commercial farms, and that is what they call aquaculture. A 2.7 trillion are caught in the wild. Now, over 87% of our fisheries have collapsed. And these collapses of fisheries have led industries to not change the fish they offer, but simply lie about the fish they're offering to us to ensure their sales stay, stay okay. Um, now, today I found it fascinating. There's more than 90% of the seafood consumed in the U.S. is imported, which is a, a really wild if you think about it because we have water everywhere. Um, but we're going to get into that, actually. There was a recent report that was released that shows the level of fish fraud that Oceana just published. We're going to get into it here in a few minutes. But imagine that, 90% of the seafood consumed in the U.S. is imported. Less than 1% is inspected for fraud. So this means that 90% of the options you have as a fish eater, 1% of those have been inspe inspected for fraud. Now, fish fraud might not sound like a very dangerous thing, but we're going to get into some aspects of it from your health to ramifications around the world and how it's an industry that really needs to find a way to be curtailed. Uh, hey, Coralie, nice to see you here. Uh, hey, Coralie, also I wanted to see how everything's been going. Um, I know that you've actually switched over recently 
to um, eating some uh, eating a little bit more vegan style, and I wanted to see how you were feeling. And hey, anyway, anybody out there that has made that adjustment to try and eat vegan, please do this out now. So here we're gonna we're gonna talk about these things. Um, we're gonna talk about. Uh, as our quote said, you know, if you're raised in shackles, you'll think the shackles give you the ability to walk. Um, now, the reason that I bring this up is that we have multiple generations right now that are dealing with the environment as it is. Now, the generations may argue about what's happened, but one, one thing I wanted to share with everybody is uh, I had to get a, um, a biopsy the other day. Now, all my friends here uh, know that I've been battling cancer since 2005. Um, and it caused me to change my diet. I just had to have a biopsy because my tumor's been growing back. And here's the thing about that is my cancer gave me the ability to go out and investigate the world because they can't figure out what my cancer is. So I wanted answers, so I left and I, I, I traveled the world and I tried to find environmental crimes and tried to understand how pollutants and how other things would, would cause this cancer. Now what that, I always call that, and my friends will know this, they, I call this um, my sharpening stone. You know, it's something that made my soul really kick into gear. And it's something that gave me a focus and, and a way to, to get out there. So for me, um, I would say that it, it's, it's somewhat of a good experience. Now, why I bring this up is because it changed my perspective drastically about everything. It changed it about my diet, about the way that I live, about how important every day is. Uh, it changed it. Now, everybody in their life has something that has been their sharpening stone. I know everybody out there has had a challenge that seems almost insurmountable, um, right? And, and But the thing is, is, is uh, I know from talking to I see all these names I see out there that all of you have done the same thing that I've done, which is you've taken that that thing and you've turned it into a positive energy that pushes your life forward. And I think that there's something amazing about that. Um, and I think it's something we can all relate to. Now, the reason that I bring this up is let's take it from a personal level and let's do it uh, and generationally, because our sharpening stone is our foundation. Uh, it, 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 it challenges our soul to build a foundation of which we're going to build our course of action, how we live every day. For me, I found that I wanted to be, um, you know, I wanted to be compassionate. I wanted to be kind and I wanted everything that I live from to have that in it because that was the only way every day had a meaning to me. Now, we all have our different things that we live by. Um, and again, we all have had a sharpening stone, you know. Uh, I, I just relayed a story because I know that everybody out there can relate. See, life does this to all of us, right? But here's the thing. When, when our sharpening stone kicks in, our foundational concept changes and our foundation that we build on changes. So now if we do think about it generation, generationally, I'm 46, myself and generations before me and probably people 10 years after me, um, I don't know, and nobody has to tell me how old they are. <laughs> um, we all had a belief that the ocean was boundless and limitless and it was our, uh, our resource right now it's not a resource now it's a commodity it's one of the biggest commodities in the world and it's the most traded commodity in the world uh although it it's our resource now if you're like me and you're and you're vegan you don't eat fish it's a different concept but i'm just talking right now about when we see them out there in the streets we should be really amazed and we should be proud that they're carrying on you know we all of our generations have always fought for what we found important throughout the context of the time we lived through. Now, these kids are seeing their future being stolen and disappearing, and they're looking for answers and they want change. And they understand that thinking the way that my generation thought is how we ended up here. So they're looking for new ways to change their future. And then just imagine that, like, you know, you see something so clearly that you're in your teens and you decide, that that is something that has to be addressed or, you know, you might not have fish in the future. Now that is not an alarmist thing. Like I said, over 80% of the fishing has collapsed. Um, now let's get into some nitty gritty about fishing, which gets really crazy. I've got some videos to show you guys from, I was in the Philippines, I was in Cambodia, um, I was in Vietnam. We're going to talk about how all these countries work together 
And we're going to talk a little bit about how phishing is everyone's problem and how fish fraud is everyone's problem. Guys, seriously, if you eat fish, you have to be careful. Um, oh, and I just wanted to say, Corley, great. I am so happy to hear you have more energy. I am so glad. I'm glad your body is really taking to it. I would like to share with everybody. I just had my uh, blood panel done and um, everything is perfect level. I have no issues with B12, iron, uh, any of the things that people tend to ask me, like, you know, do you get enough protein? Do you get enough iron? Do you get enough B12? The answer is for my body, eating whole foods and occasionally some junk vegan food <laughs> that I like to heat up um, seems to be okay for my body. So you don't need the argument that I need meat to survive is not for me, not for my body. Now, of course, obviously I'm not a dietitian and I'm not a doctor, so I can't speak in that level, but I just wanted to share with everybody that, that that's what's up. Uh, and I was very happy about that because you never know, right? I just said to her, listen, I'm, I eat vegan and I'd like for you to test everything just to make sure I'm okay. Everything's good. So, um, Coralie, it's awesome. I'm, I think it's so awesome. Um, uh, Michelle, thank you. Ta Tanya is vegan two years. Fantastic, Tanya. Tanya, I'm curious, did you go vegan um, for health or for moral reasons or was it sort of a combination of the two? It's always interesting because vegans all have different stories. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm always curious about that. Uh, Joanna, hi, uh, later on YouTube. Okay, no worries, Joanna. You're always nice to see you on here. Um, you're always such a big activist and I appreciate you being on the show with us. It means a lot. And uh, Camilla, um, oh, thank you, Camilla. Hey, Heather, oh my gosh. Heather is a great friend up in Pacific Northwest. And um, Heather spends a lot of time working on the Dominion, which is a 1940s tugboat. And it's still in its wood form. And they have gone through, and I, I can't even tell you, there's an amazing story. Maybe we can do a segment one day with her. Um, but there's a family connection and she has, together with Captain Dave, brought this boat back to life and it's an open museum. It's the coolest thing in the world. When I was uh, living up Pacific Northwest on the Modoc for a little bit as we were trying, starting to refit it for anti-fishing campaigns, uh, that was something <clears throat> that we found. So hi, Heather. Um, Heather, if you can put the link on, I can't type it while my, my, my podcast is running, but if not, guys, I am going to put a link down so you can go check out Heather's work um, because that's important. Um, you know, keeping roots with our with our understanding and what's amazing about the wood boats is i'm going to show you guys a boat yard where they make trawlers and they're all made out of wood it's amazing it's an art form yet it's the most destructive form of fishing so anyway let's get back to what we were checking out let's check this out so we talked about the fish kill numbers we talked about the fact that there was over 2.7 trillion fish being caught which means that you know, um, I mean, we're going to run out soon, right? I mean, it is, there's no way. And with a, a collapse of over 80%, what's happening is a lot of these countries are now going to other countries to get their fish. So this is what we found. And I'm going to show this to you guys here in a quick second. But what happens is as fisheries collapse, countries go to other countries to take fish. So which country exports the most seafood? Now, this is fascinating. China has the largest catch in seafood. Now, China is very aggressive in the way that they run things in the South China Seas. And I'm going to share with you guys video here in just a few minutes of some of the South China Seas stuff that I saw when I was out there. Um, Norway, 8.8 .8 billion. Vietnam, we're going to go to Vietnam. We're going to go look at their boats and their trawlers and talk a little bit about what's happening there. USA, now... How crazy is that, that we have a commercial fishing industry and we are exporting $5.1 billion in seafood? Anyway, uh, India and Canada. So there we go. Um, now, uh, what I wanted to do is, uh, and again, I just wanted to say, I'm not talking about local fishermen. This is me um, on a local fishing boat in Cambodia. And these guys are, they work really hard. You know, I might not agree on a um, personal level with fishing or eating fish, um, but here's where it changes. These are small, small villages. 
And I'm going to share this to you guys because here's the problem is that this fishing industry keeps these people poor. And it's a big industry. And, and when we start to talk about conservation, people always say, what about the fishermen? But I want to show you that these fishermen are struggling to survive. And it's not really helping anybody. Um, all right. So anyway. Hey, everybody, just want to say hi, get a voice again. So we are now going to go. There's an amazing new report that was just released back. Um, so, whoops. So anyway, let's go check this. And here we go. So this is the Oceana study. Okay. Uh, now they just went in and tested everything with DNA. And there are actually fish testing DNA stations all around. Um, where and they're doing this and and we're going to get into this further when we start getting into the extinction of the pink dolphin which is coming up next too so i'm so excited everybody's here today this is a very action-packed day there's a lot to talk about so uh here we go let's start right now up at where seattle washington right where heather is uh dominion tug um only 20 percent mislabeled not bad oregon portland 20 percent really not too bad um, now we're going to go to Northern California, 38% Southern California. Uh, so if you live here in Los Angeles, you have a 52% chance that what you're eating is not what you think you're eating. Uh, now Austin is a really troublesome one. That's 50% also. So half of the seafood sold in Austin um, is mislabeled. Remember, these are DNA tests that show how much is mislabeled. Uh, now we're going to go to Chicago. Thirty percent is actually. I mean, I can't. I don't want to say it's not bad. There, sh it should be zero percent. We should be eating what you. Every consumer, if you do buy fish, you should be knowing what you're buying. And the danger here is that you don't. Uh, if you live in Pennsylvania, you're over fifty percent. And I have good friends in Pennsylvania. This is very dangerous, guys. Be careful, please. Um, know your source. If if you're going to eat fish. Eat, Right now might be a good time to stop eating fish. I'm just going to throw that out there because, A, all the fish tested had microplastics. And microplastics, once we eat them, by the time they get to us through biomagnification, are toxic in our blood, everybody. So I care about everybody out there. And, again, I, I'm not asking you to be vegan, um, but I am asking you to be careful about what you eat from fish and to really know what's going on. All right, now the very last one. Let's go check it out. Now, what we see here is um, we actually have uh, New York 40%. If you live in New York City, you have a 40% chance of eating another fish. Um, Atlanta, Georgia, 25% is really not bad. And Southern Florida. Now, this is a statistic I wanted to focus on. For all my friends in Florida, check this out. King mackerel, a fish on the FDA's do not eat list. For sensitive groups due to high mercury was sold as grouper in the grocery stores that's dangerous look the same thing up here what you see in new york do you guys see that this is this is the danger now this is what i wanted to talk about because some people say well fish fraud what does it matter here's what it matters um fish fraud is very difficult because okay you have fish that live in warm water regions, and they have different bloods and toxins. Then you have fish that live in cold water regions that release different bloods and toxins, right? So, for example, let's say you think you're eating a fish from California cold water, but in fact, it's a white fish that was imported from, say, the Philippines. And who knows what kind of fish that is? I'm gonna show you, we're gonna go on to a fishing boat here in like five minutes, guys. I'm gonna show you an actual fishing boat in the Philippines to show you what these guys live and go through, but also to show you that you don't know what's happening at all with your fish. Um, now remember, America, 90% of our fish is imported. 1% of that is tested for fraud, which means that the importers and the sellers, there's something happening. Now I'm gonna guarantee you it's not the fishermen. Look, these are mostly very poor people that are, are, are fighting to survive. And I'm not talking about indigenous fishermen. Um, I'm talking about commercial fishing, and, and we'll get into that as well uh, as, as we get closer and closer, as we continue on. Um, but anyway, this is something you guys really need to be careful. I'm gonna put the link to this report on this podcast. So when you're done, please come back 
and please click on that link and please look where you live. Look at what fish is happening there. Google fish fraud with your zip code. They'll list restaurants for you. There is an endless amount of information out there and everybody please be careful. Okay guys, because here's the thing, is if you are getting a warm water fish and you live in a cold water area, often the toxins can cause neuroses, neurotoxins, and sometimes death. And there have been deaths attributed to fish fraud. So everybody be careful, okay? Um, this is very, very, very dangerous. And again, I'm please don't uh, think that I'm trying to get you to stop eating fish, but I'm telling you from what we've seen, it's crazy out there. So let's talk about now. So now we've talked about the fact that this fishing is, is the biggest industry right in basically the world um so sorry i'm moving and Mar marty's producing a show over here on the floor next to me and i don't want him to anyway um okay so we've talked about the fact that the fisheries have collapsed and now fishing is being exchanged for other fishing and the first example of what that does is it creates these giant commercial fisheries right and it actually creates what's considered fishing slavery. Now, there is a big issue with this in um, Indonesia, uh, in a lot of countries. What happens is these guys are basically in very poor areas, and these guys will go, um, they'll be in the town square, and people will be handing out flyers saying, come on, come fishing, you're going to make $1,000. You know, uh, they do it for their families. Most of these guys, they have families. You know, they're working. They're they're just in a place that has no work and no money. And the broker who gives them the job says, you show up on this day and uh, you're just I'm just going to charge you a small fee. Right. So the guy shows up. They get on there. Um, when you get on a boat, for those of you who don't know or have not worked on boats, you give over your passport to the captain generally and they keep them safe. They keep them in like a wet safe, you know, in the case, say the boat goes down or you, you go through a customs, it's easier for the captain to have a list of the passports of the crew and say, here's everybody's. So you give up your passport when you get on a ship. Now, most of these guys, I've seen stories where they are basically the harvest is done. And what they'll do is they'll bring out processing ships. So the guys can't get off the boat. Then the ship goes back to sea. Next thing, they're six to nine months, sometimes over two years at sea, not getting paid, getting physically abused, sometimes sexually abused, sometimes murdered. Um, this is what, when we talk about commercial fishing, we can't talk about fishermen like, you know, like it's our uncle and he's got the yellow thing on, on Captain Gordon or whatever, and he's pulling up a few lobster in Maine. Again, that's not what we're talking about. Fishing is a huge multi-trillion dollar industry. And a lot of it's been based on fraud because we're simply running out of fish. <clears throat> so what they're doing is they're getting these guys, they're sending these guys on three weeks to get to another country. And these guys are just slaves and it is called slavery. There's a global slavery um, page. There's a documentary called Ghost Fleet that is outstanding about this. And you can Google it. You can find out this topic. But the thing is, is when you're buying fish, and especially if it's from overseas and especially if you're not 100 percent sure what it is you don't know the person that caught it you possibly could be helping to pay for some of this slavery although you do not intend to and i wanted to show you guys a little um a thing here about how the slave labor feeds on the seafood supply chain now human trafficking is in step one and step three generally step one being where the guys are out there pulling up the nets, um, doing the hard work. And, and guys get killed doing this. This is dangerous, dangerous, dangerous hard work. And as much as I am not into fishing or fish as food, um, I don't have any ill feelings towards these fishermen because these guys are really fighting hard. So let's always remember, we're talking about a couple greedy boat owners when we're talking about fishing, commercial fishing, again, not talking about small commercial enterprise, not talking about tribal fishing, not talking about guys that want to go fishing on a Saturday or whatever. Um, please don't misunderstand where we're coming from. 
This is about the world being a little too reliant on seafood. Sidebar, don't eat shrimp. Yes. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, thank you, Chelsea. Welcome, Chelsea, and thank you, Chelsea. <laughs> um, it's a twofer right there. Do not eat shrimp. Guys, shrimp is... Um, the bycatch involved in shrimp fishing is out of control. Um, shrimp itself is one of the biggest destructions. And we're actually going to get to how shrimp are caught a little bit down the road here when we talk about uh, trawling and the destruction of trawling. But so anyway, I wanted to show you guys. Um, oh, hi, Chelsea. Yes. So um, what we're seeing is a lot of this issue uh, for these guys, mostly in um, Thailand. Thai, the Thai fishing industry is one of the most exposed, but I know for a fact it happens in Cambodia, Vietnam, and some other areas as well. Um, so what they'll do is, uh, yeah, once they bring the guys in and they're stuck on these boats, and you guys can see these processing vessels will come through. So a lot of times these guys uh, will never get paid, or if they do get paid, they get beat up. Sometimes the authorities have to intervene but generally the boats that'll hold the hostages and the slaves. so once you get in the water it gets very confusing the moment you leave a dock it gets very very complicated um and a lot of people pay the price so i wanted to show you guys that okay so uh that is one of the side effects of the mass commercial fishing now um i would now like to show you guys we went on um Ooh, yes, and Chelsea brings up a great point. All shrimp have TSP, and what they do, especially overseas, they, they shrimp, and what shrimp is in there? Shrimp from Thailand, gotcha. Uh, and then they will actually inject extra things in there, so the shrimp appears plumper. Um, so again, that is another one that if you are somebody that still does eat seafood, please be careful, please know that, and please avoid that uh, in any way that you can. Now, I would like to show you guys a quick video of, uh, this is when I was in the Philippines. I was out with Earth Race Conservation, and uh, this video is, is courtesy of Earth Race Conservation. I shot the video. Um, this is a ship that we boarded that we found fishing in um, marine protected areas. So once we got in there, and you're going to see that there's a fin shark. A lot of things come into play here when you get into these things. But, you know, you're going to get an idea of how these guys live and what it's like. Um, I was out with a few Navy SEALs and a couple local um, uh, Coast Guard and we were Earthrise Conservation and we were going to help patrol. Uh, basically there was a small village, I'll show you guys here, that said look there are all these commercial fishermen coming in and stealing from our tribal waters. Can you patrol them for us? And uh, it, we did. So we spent days out at sea. And I'm going to show you guys some of the stuff that we found. But anyway, here's a video of us boarding. Um, <laughs> In uh, Tagala, what the name? Is this Skipjack? Uh, can we look at the other holds as well? Is the same fish or? Is it the same fish or different fish? <laughs> Sa Vietnam, sa Vietnam mo yan, bago na kuha po namin. Baby shark. 
Doon nila Ria. What the name? Yeah, ni balik ko naman yan. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, pwede yan. Yun ay tinulong namin kasi tatapon naman. This is a small shack. Para sa'yo kita tapon naman. Huli ng Vietnam. Huli ng Vietnam. Huli ng Vietnam. Huli ng Vietnam. Bago. Okay, so I wanted that's the video I wanted to share with you guys. That's how those guys live on these boats. Um, and again, they are the low hanging fruit, you know, they're not the ones that we need to be thinking about. Uh, and what was nice about being out there was that the authorities we were with knew that. So we didn't get those guys in trouble, but we did get the information and the local villages were able to file charges and make a prosecution against the companies that were stealing their fish. Now that same village that I was showing you in the marine protected area, uh, still in the Philippines, we also caught um, a few other fascinating types of boats of illegal fishing that I wanted to share with you all. Now, uh, one of them is called a purse saner, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with purse saners, but purse saners are basically, will cast these huge nets, and a bunch of other smaller boats will do it, and then they'll bring a few of those into a processing. Uh, when we were in the Philippines, we caught a boat of um, a fleet of 15 um that we're doing this and this is the daylight and you can see there's this giant net to the left and that's coming up and that's pulling up all the fish onto that giant gray boat right there um this is the deck of that gray boat and this is the amount of fish you can see there's just they just pile them in this boat processes 20 million pounds of fish a day now, you have to remember that this is a company, they, they have three of these, so they're taking out 60 million pounds of fish a day. And the local villagers you were just looking at, that was a town meeting of all the villagers, there's like 100 people in that village, were starting to starve because their fish is being depleted because these companies are violating the laws and nobody's looking. Well, we were, <laughs> we caught them and we stopped them and we made them leave. So, you know, um, it was an amazing evening and uh, we went to 15 boats. And another one I want to show you all is this is what's called a light boat. Now, light boats are an amazing a part of illegal fishing. Never heard of them. You can see those giant light bulbs above those two guys there. Um, these are illegal. They're illegal to use in fishing, but... The law says as long as there's no fishing on the boat with the lights, it's legal, <laughs> right? So we went and checked out a bunch of these light boats and there is no, um, no fish on the light boats. There's no fishing allowed on the light boats. So what these guys do is they turn on these giant lights and it creates an attraction and it brings in more and more fish. And then the purse saners scoop them up in those giant nets like you guys saw there. Um, so that is purse saner. Now, purse saner is very destructive. Um, not as destructive as some of the others. But we're going to now get into a muraami, which is another form of very destructive fishing. Now, remember, this worldwide appetite for fish is leading this trail. And um, uh, let's see, Chelsea. But the thing is, is like, even if... And Chelsea, I, I do agree that local is the best way to, to be. Um, at the same time, all the local fish that's been checked has all had microplastics. So that's another issue that we're even looking at. Um, but it's there's no easy solution, huh? I mean, this is something we're all facing. Camilla says, please, let's all stop consuming fish. This is unforgivable. We are killing our oceans. Um, you know, I, I agree, Camilla. Uh, what I saw was uh, dead zone after dead zone after dead zone um, all through the South China Seas. And now I'd like to share with you guys um, what's called Muraami. Now, Muraami is where a bunch of guys jump off the boat and they have hookahs. And they don't even have like uh, regulators. Anybody out there that dives, do you see a regulator? These guys have hoses. You're going to see this. They jump off the side 
and they go and they scare the fish. They go down like a hundred feet. It's freaky. They scare the fish up. They drag these giant nets and whatever they get, they just take. You guys talk about bycatch. Most fishing, commercial fishing is literally just whatever is a thing. But I want to also show you guys the poverty. Now this video is a very special video. We did this live and Yes, I agree, Chelsea. We have to stop the pollution in the oceans. That is another horrible, horrible aspect. Plastics, pollution's everything. Yeah, gotcha. Um, so here we are. This is Captain Pete Buffoon. We are now approaching the. Uh, we've been on the water for a few days. Um, that little boat you see is. We Feel actually free to get the drone up once we're on, uh, on there, right? We're approaching what's called a Mura Ami vessel. Now, on the Mura Ami vessel, we're going to see that these guys. Sorry, let me turn this down a little bit. These guys. Um, on this vessel don't have a lot of money. Uh, again, this is the local fishing guys. And these are the guys that are supplying the fish, Not and this is in the Philippines, not only to the Philippines, but to other areas. Um, now this boat did check out to be Filipino, but it was like something out of water world. Like, look at this thing. These are the guys, this is how they live. Their clothes are on the side. And again, these guys might be at sea for 40, you know, days, I think they go out for a month, they said. Um, they live like this. They barely get paid. They have a very high death rate. Mora Ami actually was outlawed in some areas because so many children died from being Mora Ami um, divers. The nets would get stuck and they would send children down because they were smaller to move them, um, to move things around. So here's the inside of the, of the fishing, fishing vessel, which not many people get to see. Um, we just kind of walked right in it because we wanted to see what was happening. Um, and we wanted to see what was, what was going on. So as we were going through, this is going to be pretty crazy. Um, now actually Chelsea, I have to say China and Japan, uh, are not the worst in the far as pollution goes. Um, when it comes to corporate pollution, um, the North America actually has the most amount. Um, between Canada and then all of our South American, well, I guess all the American continents. Uh, South America has so much industry in, in North America. Um, now, as far as plastics go, there are some Asian countries that are far higher by volume, but they are mostly because we ship all of our plastics over there. Um, anyway, we have some amazing, um, the lost children. Yes. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Uh, so now, guys, check this out. See all those tubes? Those are these guys' hookahs. Look at how crazy and complicated this is. These guys are all going to go jump. Now, they're wearing pieces of plastic for their um, fins, and they're wearing a little diver one. Uh, you guys saw it just has the little round thing, um, and that is how they keep – see that little <laughs> – you guys see that? That's how they keep things from getting – look at this. This is crazy. This is air supply for up to 20 divers at once jumping off the side of these boats. Um, the death, like I said, the death rate for them is generally uh, around, I think, a, I believe a, about a 70% um, for Mora Ami. Now, Earth Race uh, is, has a couple more videos that they shot also underneath. Now, check this guy out. This guy's got a cigarette. Now, this guy knows it's so deadly. Watch, he's gonna make a cross before he goes in because he knows he might die. This is very powerful. Just watch this. Here's his possible last cigarette. Watch this. He crosses and he goes in. That's how big the death rate is there. This is what people are doing so that people can eat, have a choice to eat some fish. And I think we need to be thinking about that. So you saw the thing on the left. That's the rope, the net. And the things on the right are all wire, uh, all air tubes and more divers. So they're just gonna keep dropping those guys. Now look, those are their wetsuits, guys. Their wetsuits are layers of clothes. Layers of clothes. That's their wetsuits. Now I know you're thinking, oh, well they're in the warm, it doesn't matter. These guys go down 100 feet. That's three thermoclines, right? Or in the third, that gets cold. So Murami, uh, yes, Bruce, The Lost Children, that's the name of the movie that they made about that. Um, insane and it's crazy that they still do more army fishing as you guys just witnessed right it's illegal but we just went on the boat think about that think about that this is how how much 
how big of an industry this is. Remember, it's the number one traded commodity in the world, right? Yeah, Vicky, exactly. Once you get down past that thermoclines, guys, it drops temperature. I mean, and it drops fast. And a lot of these guys also die from hypothermia. And that's no joke. Um, a lot of dangerous things these guys go through. Now, the very last type of, of, of illegal fishing I want to talk about before we get into how illegal fishing is driving extinction, but first we talked about slavery. Now we're talking about destruction. Now we're going to talk about extinction. There's a lot to talk about there too. Oh my gosh, I can't believe we've been talking for 45 minutes. I feel like this one's going by super fast. There's so much to talk about. Anyway, what I'd like to share with you guys is um, this is, uh, so what we found is in the Philippines, and as you saw, the Vietnamese boats came in. Then we went to Cambodia, and we found that the Vietnamese boats also came in. Now, I wanted to show you guys, this is a small fishing village in Cambodia, okay? This is, um, this is how these people live. This is what I mean. There's not a lot going on. Um, so... What I wanted to show you all is, let's see, okay. What happens is these are Cambodian trawlers. Now, if you look at that orange square on the back, that's a door. It's a giant door. Now that door is attached to, that door is attached to electric uh, current that they put down there. And they do what's called electric trawling which kills and shocks anything on the ocean floor. Imagine that. Kills and shocks anything on the ocean floor. Now, what these guys do is they lay out these huge nets, right? And with the doors, for example, that you just saw, they, would, they have a door on each side, and those two doors just run on the bottom. Just destroy everything on the bottom. Now, guys, this is the main way that fishing happens internationally, trawling. Trawling is that basically their fisheries had collapsed. So they now travel up to three to four weeks to go into international waters by Cambodia and the Philippines and get as much fish as they can. So we went to Vietnam. <laughs> Here we are. These are trawlers. And this is a huge, um, this is a giant fleet of trawlers. I mean, everything's a trawler there, guys. Everything. It's, it's crazy. And wh what I wanted to share with you was that um, we did a, uh, I went to where they build the trawlers. Now trawlers are kind of amazing in the sense that they're all built out of wood. Um, although it does lead to a lot of deforestation, but look at that, it's old wood. And I think if you were somebody who appreciated boats, there might be something fascinating about the craftsmanship that these guys do. Um, now again, this is a giant trawler, okay? So this is what they are. They're just this little thing there. They got the door in the back, and um, this is a trawler shipyard. We went to where they were building the trawlers to see what was happening, and that's why I wanted to share that with you guys. Um, now, super, super, super destructive form of fishing. Um, trawlers destroy everything. Uh, they're very aggressive. They work in groups, and um, yeah, those guys are absolutely... Yeah, they're, they're intense. So um, anyway, <clears throat> the trawlers bring in the most amount. They go around. And so it's a very tricky situation because we have international hunger for, for fish. And we have international sales for fish, right? And we don't have any enforcement in between. I mean, when we were in parts of the Philippines, the Coast Guard would have one boat, and that one boat had a hole on it, in it, and that one boat was in the boat yard getting worked on. Uh, Linda, this is appalling. Ignorance is not bliss. Now I can't unhear this. I have to be proactive. Yes, Linda, I love that approach, um, and it's true. And listen, remember, if you're eating fish, remember that all fish tested had microplastics. And remember that microplastics are plastics that break down, and then they break down, okay, they go from big plastics down to teeny bits of plastic, and then little things eat them, right? Or basically little teeny amoebas become attached to them, and then another animal eats that, and then now they've ingested it. Then through a process called biomagnification, the toxicity of these plastics grows and grows and grows until it gets to our bloodstream. 
once we eat fish. And once we eat that, it goes in and then we have blood poisoning. And it's led to a lot of things. Now, a lot of, you have to think about it from a, a point of view of a legal standpoint, a lot of doctors and a lot of studies are not going to be given, even though it's important to us, because this is something that would make companies liable. And so we have to aware, you know, be aware of that. Um, yes, Taiji is also terrible. That is another, that's its own special hell. Um, so microplastic water filter. Yeah, you know, Chelsea, that's a great point. You can get a good microplastics water filter for your, um, let me see if I can find it on here real fast, for your washing machine where tons of microplastics come out microplastic let me see if i can put this up for you guys um so that is one way to be super proactive and to keep the plastics from going out there uh, now recently i saw there was a a whole bunch of people wanting to add um, plastic reefs into local waters um, which i i think is a terrible idea because you have this issue of um of of the plastics so you know um <clears throat> it, no matter what those are eventually going to become um you know microplastics so anyway i was trying to look for something i couldn't find it we're not going to worry about it right now but i will put up a link later or chelsea if you have a good link for the one that you use or um but but guys they do sell them and if you just you just they're like 100 150 bucks you put them on your um washing machine and it'll reduce tons of the microplastics which is something that would be very very important um yeah plastic reefs I, I just have an issue with that you know when i was overseas i saw reefs made out of bamboo and reefs made out of concrete two materials that uh, are fully organic um and wouldn't add anything and with the amount of microplastics already in the fish that's being eaten through biomagnification. I think the concept of adding any more plastic is, is a bad idea. We need to find a way to stop right now. We can reverse all this. Um, yes, I know, Chelsea, the idea was to clean the ocean, um, but it needs to be done through an organic material because even if it's there to clean the ocean, those plastics will eventually chip and become microplastics. So yes, and radioactive fish is a whole other thing. And that's what I wanted to come to next, which is the danger to all of us through this environment. And one thing that I want to bring up is there's a very, um, very, um, another side effect to fishing is extinction. Now we know about tuna extinction. Uh, we've he all heard about the economics of extinction where when the fish become more valuable when there's less of them. But <clears throat> there are side effects. So we're now gonna go to the Amazon because the Amazon has a perfect example of what's happening. The Amazon is where, okay, so in Colombia, they have a special taste for catfish, right? Um, now they have collapsed all their fisheries because they've all eaten all their catfish. So this opened up a spot in the Amazon in Peru. And what happened was Peru has a catfish and Brazil have a catfish that eats mostly in Brazil that eats um, dead flesh. So the fishermen in Brazil cut up what are uh, pink dolphins, kill them and use their flesh as an oily fish bait. And then all these catfish come up and start eating this dead flesh. Then they catch these things by the boatload then they illegally send them to Colombia. And then Colombia, they sell them as the other fish. Now, that's just not bad for Colombians because they don't know what they're eating. Now, because think about it, some catfish eat flesh and decaying dead things and some don't. So people in Brazil won't eat this particular fish, piracatinga, because it is loaded. It is because it eats the dead flesh. <laughs> so they're like, that's gross. We wouldn't eat that. The Colombians will, as long as they don't know they're eating it. So, small example of fish fraud, but it's leading to the extinction. In a town called Iquitos in Peru, about two kilometers from the Amazon River, and they have a pink dolphin in captivity here. Now, this dolphin was caught about 10 years ago as a baby. It's been held in this facility ever since. The swimming pool it's in has no filtration, 
had a bunch of sores in 2015 that still haven't healed. The pool's really, really shallow. He's often got a damaged nose on him from hitting the bottom. And of course, they do the sea wheel trick where they get him out, display him. He does tricks and, and people get to go and take their photos and films of him. And it's really, really crazy. We're only two kilometers from the Amazon River. People pay money to come here and see the wildlife in its natural environment, and yet they're dumb enough to come here and pay money to see a poor old dolphin in captivity. Um, tourists suck, I tell you. Okay, so the pink dolphin is endangered. And I had to put that sound in at the end because that's the, their cry. Um, now they're almost endangered. Now, I don't know if you all are familiar with the IUCN, what's called the red list. And the red list is an active category of populations according to scientific observation. Uh, you can go to it if you want. It's uh, the IUCNredlist.org. And I'm going to actually show you real fast. Um, and you can look up where you live. You can look up any of the animals you live near. You can see I did the pink dolphin. Um, and it's critically endangered, right? And its number is disappearing. So go to the IUCN red list. Look where you live. Look at what industry is doing to your area. This is an example of how fish fraud is creating extinction. And I just wanted to make everybody aware of that, okay? Because it's, again, we try to localize the problems, but in a sense, we're all connected. And this fish fraud is international. Well, it's very international. So we need to think about what's happening. And that, that report, at, and Chelsea, um, I know you, you, you joined us after we talked about it. I'm going to be adding a link to the recent Oceana report that'll show you the types of fish and the fish fraud. Now, the most common fish, I believe, that the fish fraud happens in is um, cod, which doesn't, I don't think, really exist anymore. If you have like fish and chips, you're generally not eating cod, you're eating something else because the cod fisheries collapsed. Um, tuna is the other big mislabeled fish, and grouper, snapper, sea turtles are suffering there. Oh, Chelsea, I have seen. Oh, I've seen those terrible photos recently of um, of what's happening with the with the turtles, and it's so sad. You know, Florida is under attack um, in so many levels between the nutrient pollutions, the microplastics, um, everything. I uh, you know, and but it's been amazing because again, I always say this: Florida has some of the the most difficult issues, but Florida also has some of the best activists I've ever seen. Which, speaking of which, guys, I'm very excited. We are going to have an upcoming Florida episode uh, with Scott Wilson. So if anybody who's lived in Florida will know he's an OG activist that is going to really help us understand the pesticides and the poisoning of the waters and the interconnectedness of the waters. Because that's what, the other thing about the waters, we looked at the currents in a previous episode, they all connect. Uh, Camilla, boycott SeaWorld, absolutely. Uh, boycott all of those places. Yes, I agree. Um, you know, we need to get away from the idea that that's okay. You know, we need to get away from the idea that animals can be our entertainment, that they are our resource. They're not our resource. You know, there's that image we had before of ego, and it has man at the top of the, the diamond, and then e eco, and it's a circle, and man in part of it, not even in the center of it. <laughs> And we have to remember that, you know. Um, so today I really wanted to bring up a lot of things to show what's happening out there. You know, again, this international craving for fish is, is killing things. And now we're not, they're not taking care. Because here's, here's the thing. And again, I think people might get a little upset when I talk about this. But you having the option to buy fish at a supermarket is not as important as an indigenous tribe having access to fish, period, that's just the end of it. And we are losing that access, that private access, that access uh, where these tribes at least respected nature and they had a symbiotic relationship with nature. Um, you know, and, and what we found is that they don't have that always, um, you know, anymore. So 
we lose touch of it. Remember, all of our fish comes in like plastic wrap thing or it has a name to it. And most people don't know. Pink dolphin is even killed, smoked, and sold as a white fish jerky in Peru. And we found some of that when we were out there. Um, they smoke it and, and it's illegal. But what they do is they put their, they'll, they'll, they'll smoke it on boats on the river. So they're not on land. So laws don't apply. It's a very tricky thing. There's always a loophole that allows things to go through. And those loopholes um, are where a lot of this exploitative stuff happens, you know. Um, so again, if you don't eat fish, I know you probably never will. If you do, please be careful. Also remember that when you look at it, I learned this from my friend who's a biologist, that there's little, uh, if there's ever little like uh, dark spots, those are actually worms uh, that are in there. So I guess don't just try not to eat those. Those are signs of unhealthy fish. Um, I would say that until things get handled, please be careful. Be careful what you're eating, where you're eating it from. Remember, it's not that frame of reference we grew up with. The fish doesn't come from the ocean. It's not clean water. All the water is, is nasty. Everything has pollution in it. Um, we are in a new crisis. We're seeing a climate issue happening. We are seeing food crisis happening. We are seeing food deserts happening. And we are killing all of our resource. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not a good path that we're on. And so I just wanted people to understand that fish fraud is so prevalent in America and illegal fishing is so prevalent around the world. And those two feed off each other, you know? So seriously, when you're out at the restaurant, just choose something else. Like if, if, if we don't allow them in because you're not, you don't know what you're eating. Uh, you just don't know. So that's, um, you know, something for everybody to think about, please be careful. It's not what we think it is. The laws are not there to inspect. Remember everybody, 90% of the seafood is imported and 1% of that 90% is searched for accuracy. And out of that they found, uh, and then they went around and found that at least over half of everything was mislabeled, which can lead to neuro poisoning. It can lead to disease. It can lead to death. You know, um, even if a chef doesn't know the fish that they're eat, they're cooking comes from the tropics and they prepare it wrong, it can create a poisonous reaction in a lot of fish. So we have to remember there are many, many elements where our health is at stake. And yes, Coralie, vote with your wallets, exactly. Let them know what's acceptable and what is not. Um, you know, and if, if you do eat fish, go support your local fishermen. But even then, um, I mean, they're obviously not gonna lie about what they caught. They're struggling to make a, a living, but then you have to get into your second issue of what is mercury, what is microplastics, and how do you know what to do? So it's all very tricky. Um, it's very complicated for me. I just took the easy way out, I guess. I don't just don't need it. <laughs> uh, but the, the biggest danger is that it's touted as a healthy alternative for us. And if we think about it, we all think that. Um, when I used to eat meat, I definitely ate fish and rice. Um, and it's, it's being told as a very healthy alternative. You know, uh, what we're seeing is it's is it's not um, for a lot of us. So, you know, and again, I was on islands with five people and I would never tell them to not eat fish because that's all they had was fish and rice, you know? Um, Andrea, yeah, it's crazy that fit, usually fish is promoted as the first healthy choice. Exactly. That's true. It's true. They make you think, you know, if, and, and but here's the thing, you're going to have beef, it's got chemicals, pesticides. You're going to have dairy, it's going to have... Um, pus and hormones, you know, you have fish, it's going to have um, either injected things like think about it, guys, salmon often has dye injected in it because the farm raised salmon is not the same color as the natural salmon and the wild caught salmon is almost depleting and the bears are starving. You know, do we really need it that bad? The orcas are starving because we're eating wild caught salmon. Who are we to do that? The orcas are dying. We all saw that orca die. There's a huge debate up there in, in Washington right now. I got to be part of it, but it's still playing out. <clears throat> but, you know, for us to have that choice is to take a choice away from an animal that's naturally supposed to be there. Um, 
Now, you know, here's the thing, guys. We can fix it. We can fix it. We can change this. It's all changeable. We now know there's fish fraud. We have to work at demanding to know what's happening. We have to make these companies take accountability. And we have to say, listen, if they don't do all this, we're not going to buy anything until they do. You know, we don't want these guys ending, getting, becoming slaves on these ships for two years, not getting paid. Some of them just getting shot, killed. Some of them go missing. You know, their kids are growing up without their dads because their dad thought they could have helped afford them to eat, you know, back home. Um, these people are being tricked into it and it's a nasty business. And, you know, we're not, it's not a big thing to support. So when people say, we're not supporting the fishermen, just think about those, those, th those fishermen those are the ones you're supporting when you buy stuff at the stores. Um, obviously, I'm talking on a mass scale, but, and as I showed you guys, the Philippines, Cambodia, Vietnam, all the South China Seas are all connected and they're exporting the majority of the fish over to us. You know, Vietnam currently has a yellow card in the EU for being such bad neighbors and stealing so much fish and everything. So there is a lot going on. Um, there's just not a lot of enforcement and not a lot of people care. But the thing is, is, you know, um, these fisheries, they estimate will collapse by 2050. So it's possible we're going to end up with only farmed fish by 2050. And if we do that, we are entering a whole other world of health issues where we have found that over 90 percent of farmed fish also have health attributes. So, um, you know, it's important to stay educated. It's important to educate yourself. It's important to educate your friends. It's important for all of us to take care of each other. Remember, you know, we are all each other's brothers and sisters. These companies don't care about us or our health, but we do. We know what's happening. Um, we need to talk to each other. We need to help each other. We need to promote each other. We need to encourage each other. And most importantly, I think working together, we have all made a huge impact this year, next year, and we're on a whole new energy level that's just pushing forward. So it's a very exciting time to be alive. Uh, Camilla says, let's stop the supply by reducing the demand. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, Camilla, exactly. And I think the people that eat fish should demand to know what they're eating before they continue to eat it. And that, that is just the very, asking the very minimum. So um, anyway, I you know what guys we've hit our uh, we've hit our time. So I just wanted to thank everybody for being here today. There was a lot to talk about. Um, there was a lot of amazing conversation today. You know we went over a lot. Of world uh, guys, that's another aspect. Listen, when an endangered animal is found by fishermen, for example, the loophole internationally is they have to be taken to a zoo or a breeding ground, and those zoos then take over. So we've made it legal that they take all of the animals out and put them in these these confines. I saw it in Peru. They had a thing where if there was an injured baby uh, manatee or pink dolphin, they went to a manatee rescue that was funded by the Dallas Zoo, and they would actually sell these manatees for slaughter to local tribes by getting paid and arranging the release of them. So remember, it's all connected, and it's all designed for somebody else to make money off the life of an animal, and that's not what we're here for. Um, Thank you guys so much. I love having these conversations with you all. And I'm glad everybody's feeling happy, healthy, having a beautiful Sunday. And remember, it's our world. Let's talk about it. We can change it. It's great to see you guys. I'll see you next week. Remember next week, we start up on Saturday. Saturdays. We're moving to Saturdays. I got a lot of requests from people asking about Saturday. So I will see you all on Saturday. We have some exciting episodes coming up. All right, everybody. Great to see you again. See you soon.